Yeah, so having that said that, uh, scope of the FAIR principles, um, what it is about and what it is not about. So uh, data stewardship is about uh, many things and, and data management. So it's about what is collected. It's about how data are collected, what methods are, are used, what measurement methods. FAIR is about the third element there, about how data are offered for reuse. That is the, the main purpose of FAIR and the, the findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable for machines. The, the for machines part is also an essential element of the, the FAIR principles. Um, as you probably know, we've, we've worked on this uh, sort of generalized workflow for, uh, for verification. Uh, um, you can find publications by Annika uh, on this, Annika Jakobsen and others. Um, and I'm not, go I'm not going to any details. You see these two parts, fairness of records in a registry and fairness of the container of the registry itself. Uh, and you will see these two elements also back in our, uh, in our attempts to answer your questions. Um, in the summer school, for instance, we go through this, this uh, workflow in, in, uh, in two days. Uh, usually halfway that session, what the participants of such a course, then if, they, if you're asked to reproduce it, you'll get something like this. So that you are a bit confused uh, is, is quite normal. It's, it's quite an elaborate process to, to go through. Um, so having on the left here, the, the starting point is basically when the, the world is, is not fair, if data are not findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, that means that it's difficult to answer quer queries across multiple sources efficiently. You should also know that uh, when uh, we did a, a, a collection of FAIR standards and tools for verification, um, and we came up with a list of, of more than 80 uh, standards and tools. So also for the developers of verification, this is, a, this is a challenge. And therefore in the EJP, we do research and, and development of organizing support for stakeholders, including the steward project, the yeah, the steward organization that we set up, and the training sessions. We work on guidance, uh, as short-term, mid-term, long-term. A session like this is a bit short-term, right? Um, and there's software uh, development going on. On, for instance, the the transformation of uh, data to a more fair data, or to make software fair data generating software. And you will see some examples of that in this uh, in this session for registries. Claudio, what can you say about the summer school? Thank you, Marco. Hi, all. Uh, yes, uh, uh, <laughs> I would like to say that the International Summer School Red Disease Registries and verification of data is part of the training activities of the rural packages on data management and quality training of the EJPRD. And this course is made up of five day organized by ISS in close collaboration with EJPRD partners. This course is composed of two training modules. The general roadmap of this course foresee that participants in the first module will learn what resources are needed for the establishment maintenance of high quality registry the, and the features of a successful strategies to ensure long term sustainability of the registry, the quality and legal and ethical issues in compliance with the European General Data Protection Regulation. While in the second module, the verification of data, participants split the, in general in four or five small groups and followed by IT trainers will deepen their knowledge on the single step of the verification of data and will discover the potential of fair registries. In this part, uh, we allocated also uh, a slot time to discuss uh, fair data management and fair uh, project planning. For each step of the verification process, there, there is a, a plenary session followed by an hands on exercise and a wrap up session. If the course, uh, as last year, will be adapted in uh, an online format due to the force major situation associated with the COVID 
the 19 pandemic. In the second module, for each step of the verification process, there will be a plenary session followed by hands-on exercise and a wrap-up session. Another and last things that I would like to add regarding this course is that the, uh, the registration is free of charge and even if the course will be held as a face-to-face -face or adapted as online, uh, to ensure an active participation and exchange with the teaching staff and participants, there is a maximum number of participants admitted to each training module. And uh, with these slides, I would like to, to remember you the next edition This is that will be um, September 27, October 1. We, we will see if this, uh, this edition will be as a face-to-face -face, uh, or adapted as online. Um, this is the first step in order that uh, all the colleagues could, be, could have an, a deep introduction to each step of the verification, no, Marco? And uh, uh, very quickly. Yeah. No, thank you, uh, thank you, Claudio. So and, uh, save so the date. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Save the date for and uh, the, the registration. I think that will open on June, July. Yeah, and and I think you can see it as a practical tool for uh, learning about verification. That's uh, yes. and and one of the things, uh, uh, possibly a side effect of the the online sessions is although we're all quite heavily overworked we are planning to look at if we can reuse some of that material that we made for online if we can reuse that for having a next to the real face-to-face -face, uh, version of the summer school which is which is the, the the best it's an intensive two days but if we can reuse some of that for having additional training available available for the for the community Yes, it, yep. it's, the summer school is a first important step that yep. introduces the participants to, to do and colleagues of earn to, to the verification process. Yeah. So, and also, Claudio, and, here, if there are more questions about the, the training and the summer school, then please ask them later or put them in yes. the chat, and then Claudio can, uh, can answer them. Yeah, then I'll, I'll continue if my slides will go to the next. This is something you, you know. So something we've, we've set up also as a, as a tool, the, the verification steward. So I'm not going to in, into deeply, but it's, uh, it's yeah, to help you bootstrap the verification for your own uh, registry, your own data. So this is then the, the list of most urgent questions. And I've, at the bottom, you see that I've made one uh, gray and maybe, maybe some more should be grayed out of there for both. But so we, we won't deal with everything here because there will be additional workshops and uh, and coffee sessions on some of the topics specifically, like the UPIT is uh, is one that will be covered in uh, in future workshops. And then it can go into that much more deeply than uh, we can do here. Yeah, so I, I think, Neil, I will just continue with the my first part and then uh, hand over to others, right? So uh, the first question was about solutions for semantic and technical interoperability, practical requirements to implement the semantic model and uh, examples. So this is, I think, now the biggest part of the of the slide deck that we're presenting here. Um, so I'll, I'll make an attempt. This is a slide just to show you why we are doing this. That is the, at, at the moment, so this is to enable efficient uh, answering of questions. And there you see a little train going past fair registries and all the registries have been disambiguated. So the question can be easily answered and all the data can stay in its location without the, the problem of legal problems with putting data into one place. So this is the ultimate goal. And in the middle you see uh, semantic models. And that is the sort of common understanding that we share between these fair resources. So we're not sharing the data, we're sharing our understanding of the data. So what is then a fair registry, a fair data resource? I try to visualize that here. Um, at the bottom, you, in the, at the top in the middle, you see a fair registry. And I've pieced that apart in the, in the bottom part. So on the left, 
you see then the original database in basically whatever form or in whatever format you have that database um, that that in principle can stay or uh, remain what it is. Um, to the left of that, you see uh, what we here called a database with the semantically modeled information or description of the registry. So that's just about the whole thing. And below that, the semantically modeled data, the data in terms of uh, global ontologies. These ontologies you see on the left in this, in this cloud, which means that it's a reference that anyone can use. So there's models for describing catalogs and whole resources, and there's a model for describing actual data elements. And I'm not going into, into details here, but we relate these different data elements to one another. So that's also an important aspect. This model can have elements in it that points to different databases. And that's how interoperability works because the model connects things, not the data are in one place, but the model connects things. So in a fair registry, you have this semantically modeled data as part of your registry. You need to access that. So there needs to be some computational element that allows you to, to sort of query that information. And that is what a fair data point is. And we, we can explain that in a bit more detail, Rajaram, can explain that in even much more detail than I can. And that is the programmatic access to this modeled metadata. And then to the right of that, you see where the query comes in. So that query comes in through this access point, and then it queries that information and eventually fetches the, the actual data um, to, to compile an answer and get that back to the, the thing that queried for it. Yeah, so that is what a fair registry is. It's your original data with two additional elements. If you have, which I think many of you have, when you have a registry database, you often already have multiple interfaces or one or more interfaces. The user interface is an obvious one, but also programmatic interfaces. Basically the same applies. Then you would also describe these interfaces with that semantic model. So you have semantically modeled description of the registry and it access APIs, the application programming interfaces. So in a way that doesn't change a lot, it just becomes part of the description of your data in machine readable terms. Yeah, um, a lot of what we're showing is this, this conversion process in, in the middle. So that's also what, what uh, uh, Yuri will tell later on uh, the more genus database. This can be done by uh, electronic data capture systems. So what you need for a do-it-yourself fair data source, um, metadata, that's, uh, and that's the description about your resource. So you need to define that. And so for instance, the identifier for your organization, the APIs you have, consent that you, consent that you can refer to. Um, and yeah, we propose for the EJP to structure it with uh, the data catalog vocabulary. That's an international uh, often used model for structuring such information. Then for the common data elements, there's annotating or converting your own data with that model so that it can be queried in terms of this shared uh, uh, common data element model. And then the third element was the API to access that metadata, which means deploying a fair data point. And by doing that, you're actually uh, um, sort of deploying the DCAT model anyway, because it's all very much integrated. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can also link other data access APIs to that metadata, right? So it's a bit of a reiteration. Um, another way of, of doing it is by incorporating all of that in your electronic data capture system. And examples of that, of such software with fair capabilities is Molgenis. You will see that in a, in a couple of seconds. Um, there's also uh, the Castor system where we've done that in a, in a sort of first example, that's the FASCA registry. Um, and there's also OSA that actually, I think the very first 
fair data point and also an earlier version of the fair data point was done after a hackathon by the OCT. And that uh, is my hook to uh, the Mulgenis team. Yes, thank you very much. Let's see if I can get control. Oh yeah, can I, should I give up control and stop presenting? Uh, oh, I can allow this myself, wow. Ah, perfect, thank yeah. you. Yeah, you can uh, request control, yeah. Great, so uh, hello, my name is uh, Yuri van der Velde. I'm going to highlight the Mulgenis uh, EDC. Uh, so the software has been under development for over 15 years in a group of uh, motor threads, and it's basically used for all kinds of life science applications. Uh, so at its core, it's a customizable data system where it's possible to change the underlying data structure, including user interfaces, permissions, etc. cetera. Uh, it's, it's powered by the latest database engines for fast query performance, and it features things like batch import, exports, APIs for sharing data, and it's a completely open source product and uh, developed on GitHub. And if you're interested, you can uh, go to the website. I'm able to go to the next slide. Yes. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think someone stopped the presentation. <laughs> that, that was me. I clicked on something. Ah. <laughs> That's not ideal. Go back to <laughs> so apparently I still have some control myself as well. <laughs> are you are you still in control? No, it's, so it's you gone. have to start the presentation, Marco. Yeah, I, I am I am in presentation mode again. Uh, we don't see it. Maybe you haven't shared it. Oh, okay. I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Hmm. That's it. Okay. Yeah, we see the presentation. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned before, Multigenesis is this customizable data structure. And because in practice, users often find out what they really want by using the database instead of designing it in theory. So this, this way of working allows you to sort of set up your database and then evolve your database instead of, of starting over uh, each time again. Um, and this is also why we support Excel files as a convenient way to add and update uh, the data within your database. How do I go to the next slide? Is it spacebar? <clears throat> we should ask Marco. Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe Marco should do it. Um, so currently, four uh, ERNs are using Mulgenis as their central uh, electronic data capture system. So these are Genturis, Ithaca, Cranio, and Skin. Um, and of course, the fact that four ERNs are using it also allows the Mulgenis team to help think along with uh, uh, cross ERN harmonization uh, of data. And Multianus supports this, uh, uh, the, the mentioned uh, DCAT2 fair data point. So if you have a running uh, Multianus database, it basically takes two steps to set this up. Uh, so first you have to uh, uh, upload a, a piece of uh, fair data point data structure. Um, and then you have to uh, either upload or manually enter uh, your FTP metadata. Um, and at that point, Multianus will take care of the rest and basically become a fair data point. So that is built in. Thank you. Um, and in the next version of Modgenus, so it, it's possible to an extent now, but the next version will have powerful uh, uh, semantic mapping uh, capabilities. Uh, so here we show an example of uh, the JRC common data elements, uh, where the concept of a patient and the elements belonging to a patient have semantic annotations uh, in these uh, red uh, boxes. Um, so then the question is, okay, th this is very nice. It becomes, you know, your database becomes already more semantic, so you express more clearly what you mean. Uh, but you can also do things with this. Um, so if you have set up these annotations, um, then you can start to export the data within your database as RDF triples. Uh, and as you may know by now, RDF is sort of the, the cornerstone of making data technically interoperable. Uh, and here you see a few uh, a dummy patient records based on the common data elements that are now exported as RDF triples, uh, specifically a turtle file. 
And this is possible because uh, these annotations were, were added within the database. And, uh, and as a final note, um, uh, the things that I've, I've shown you are not necessarily all unique to Mulgenis. Other EDCs can do these things as well. Um, but I think you have to be aware that building all of these capabilities yourself is a lot of work. So please do consider using an existing EDC if you have not chosen one yet. So on that, I'd like to uh, wrap up my part. Thank you. Yeah. And, and maybe the other part I can add to the final, to the last comment you made, uh, I very much agree. Uh, if you work, because there, there's obviously many reasons why you choose an EDC, but then we would we would argue that make at least one argument if they don't already do this to make a requirement that they they work with us to start building this in. Yes. In principle, in the in, in the EJP ERN project, that's sort of built in this this process, but uh, I I, don't, I think it's useful to keep repeating it. <laughs> yeah. I think and the next is for you, uh, right, uh, Rajan? Yeah, that's right, Marco. Can you go to the next slide? And then it's easier. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marco. Uh, yeah, uh, I will address like uh, this questions like that were asked, like um, um, how much of programming need to be done on the uh, registry side to implement fair data point. So if you if you just have an EDC that already has this feature, then you don't have much of a problem. <laughs> but if you have an EDC like which doesn't have like a fair data point features, then what you can do is like you can just simply like reuse like the reference implementation of fair data point, which is developed uh, by us and different projects here in Netherlands. Uh, basically, like that system is like a well packaged. It's a standalone software application, open source MIT license. Uh, it it comes as a Docker image. So from your side, like uh, what you have to do is like uh, you simply like have to install that software in one of your uh, server. And from EJP RD side, like what we do is like we are actually organizing hackathons. Uh, people like 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 yeah like who they already have like their own EDC system, and if they want to implement like if they want to like deploy like a fair data point software along with it, we can actually like help people like uh, installing uh, the software during this hackathon. So what what is the requirement from your side? Is basically like you need to provide a server uh, where like you can host this software. I made a simple calculation like uh, how much server space is needed to host like a data point reference implementation software. This is a specification, and this is what like the cost is like uh, monthly if you buy like a server space uh, in our Snet server, which is hosted in like uh, Europe, 19 euros per month approximately. Uh, next slide, please, Marco. Yeah, uh, what are the practical steps uh, involved in implementing semantical model? So on the left hand side, <laughs> my left hand side, <laughs> you see like the requirements and the right hand side, like uh, you see like possible solutions offered by EJPRD. So first of all, like you need like a semantic model to actually like implement like implemented in your uh, database to describe it. Uh, in EJPRD, we actually like uh, uh, providing this as an artifact, right? Like uh, we have like working groups uh, for example, like a CDE uh, uh, common data element, we make like semantic model for common data element, and we make like a periodical releases, and we do maintenance for that model. And the second step is like you need to map your data structure to the common data uh, semantic model data structure. Uh, for that, like you have to do some mapping exercises. So from EJPRD side, like Mark Wilkinson uh, is actually like developing a generic tool. Which takes like a CSV file and convert that into like a CDE uh, semantic model. Uh, right now, like it's focusing on like a CSV file, but we can also do it for like other standards too, like XML JSON. Uh, if there is a standard representation, we can actually adapt that in this tool. The third thing is like once you have like a semantic model, then you have to host that data somewhere else, right? Like uh, we usually use like a triple store to host like a semantic model databases. There are like many triple store solutions available, and some of them are free. And um, uh, some of them are like commercialized, but you can get like a um, free version of it and later move to commercial version. For example, like GraphDB is really good. It has like a authentication layer on top of it. So you can just lock your data and provide to like only authorized person to use it. The last thing is like um, developer need to maintain like um, uh, the conversion data conversion pipeline, right? From the sim from the EJPRD side, what we provide is like a basic training, like uh, what Claudia mentioned, like uh, in early slides. In summer school, like we offer you like uh, basics of like uh, semantic technology, 
and tools to use generating them, hosting them. And that's it, Marco. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ram. Yes. Um, so then there was was a question that's a, a sort of a different type of question. It was a question of what is needed from a hospital. So I, I, I yeah, we're not going into that that deeply, but we can also always discuss it. Um, so this is sort of based on my observations, on our observations at, at our own hospital, the Leiden University Medical Center. Um, so uh, is it is it uh, and some other discussions we had, with some maybe with some of you here. Um, so it's, I made a distinction between whether the hospital is sort of fair-minded or not. So that, that's a, a difference. So if it is, then um, basically you could argue that the general approach, approach that we described here also applies to the hospital. You would look at what is the data management software? Can we build it in there? Uh, can you install a fair data point? Can you model the data with, with an ontological model? That basic, that basic approach also applies for the hospital then. Um, what is what, yeah, what you typically see is that they made a choice in the hospital for a certain standard or set of standards that may or may not fit with what we are doing in the, in the reality community or the EJT. And then you have a mapping need. So that, that is something that we actually would like to know. Maybe we can also make some suggestions to not start doing your own mappings, but use authoritative mappings or work together on, on good mappings. Um, that doesn't mean that we can verify hospitals. That's, that would be beyond the scope of what we can do from the, from the EJP. Um, the, what also part of this approach is that, well, like we are doing with the verification stewards, that you have this three-party investment, the software, data stewardship, local data stewardship, and fair data, data uh, experts. And obviously, as Rajam also mentioned before, the hosting of, uh, of uh, some of these software on servers. If your uh, hospital is not into FAIR at all, then uh, there's not that much that you can do apart of what I think is already sort of the default of what we see is somehow get the data into your registry and make that registry FAIR. That is the, the best what you can do, what, what we've observed is that often a copier, I call it a copier, is hired to manually copy the data from the hospital system, systems over to the registry. That is obviously not an ideal process. It's error prone, not so efficient. And yeah, as Morris is already smiling, <laughs> it's, it's technically uh, mostly not necessary. So we would argue lobby for, for the hospital going going fair and do something about this. Yeah, and, and it's also important notion, observation, I think from all of us doing this at hospitals, is do not expect that the change process will go very fast. That's just expectation management. So it's going to a more fair approach is culture change. That's hardly ever a very fast uh, process in big organizations. An example is, well, actually many uh, academic hospitals in the Netherlands are sort of in various stages of transition. So we do provide, I think, interesting examples of uh, steps towards becoming more fair as a hospital. Yeah. And one of the examples of that is that there was a call out to, to develop data stewardship competency centers in our hospitals. And many have done that now and are also collaborating to do this. So that is what I had for the question, what is needed from a from hospital? I hope that answers that question. And otherwise, you can uh, talk, uh, uh, ask more questions about it. Niru, I think now we're, this is you. <laughs> uh, this is just an announcement. I think um, most of you already know that uh, there's going to be technical workshops a lot. Uh, I, I mean, in the say, regularly, just like these coffee sessions are happening. So uh, we have quite a few of the specific details that were asked in the questions. We're going to have workshops on them. Uh, and the, we plan to start it in March. And uh, right now it's planned one every week, but uh, as depending on the speakers, we will, uh, we, the schedule might change a little bit, but the topics will not. 
So these topics will definitely be covered uh, over, uh, over the next half year, let's say. Yeah, and and maybe also good to point out that uh, based on your on your questions, it's something also that Morris and I discussed uh, up front. So it would it, it's actually nice if we it might be that there are questions that we cannot answer promptly here, but then we'll take them as input for workshops and 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 identifying new requirements, etc. So feel free to to share whatever issue you have. If you cannot answer them now, then we'll see if we can address them uh, at some other point in another event. Yeah, I think then we're down to our final slide of the the, prepar the prepared answers. Uh, so in conclusion, um, basic fairness in line with the EJPRD means uh, um, metadata modeled by the EJP metadata model, which is based on this uh, uh, DCAT standard. Um, data modeled by the CDE semantic model, uh, which is itself, again, is based on existing ontologies. We're not doing a full new reinvention here. Um, and it then makes sense to start with the, the JRC recommended CDEs because then all this applies. Uh, I should maybe add, it's not on the slide, if you want to go beyond that, talk to the stewards and we can see what we can do with what potential additional data elements, because obviously they can be modeled as well. Um, then stewards and the tools that are being developed in the EJP uh, help in the in the process. Um, you've seen in the uh, by the more genesis example, and there are more are more examples that EDC software can have this conversion process built in, and the APIs, etc. Um, and that workshops are planned on many of the aspects that relate to fair uh, that relate to fairs.